inputs used to develop those fair values. I think that's obvious. If I measure my investment properties based on the fair value model on a subsequent measurement basis, then the user would like to know. That's going to happen on a recurring basis. Do you agree? Every reporting date, we're going to remeasure our investment properties to fair value. That's going to directly have an impact on the profit and loss of the company. So it's very important that the users can understand which technique did you use to determine the fair value of the investment property. And secondly, what were the inputs? And of course, from which level did you go and source those inputs? And then secondly, for fair values using significant unobservable inputs, that means your level three, the effect of the measurement on profit and loss or on OCI for the period. So we're going to have to tell the user internally generated fair value calculations. These are those calculations. And this is the effect on profit and loss and on OCI so that we can disclose to the users where they need to pay, you know, almost like special attention or careful attention to how these assets and liabilities have been measured because they were all based on level three inputs. So I think the disclosure, the reason for the disclosure is quite self-explanatory. Slide 24, the disclosure exemptions. Now, when fair value is used, look at the first one, IS-19 employee benefits, okay? Plan assets measured at fair value in terms of IS-19. We know that we have to measure our plan assets at fair value, but you don't have to provide any disclosure requirements or meet any disclosure requirements in, in respect of your plan assets. Secondly, retirement benefit plan investments in terms of IS-26. That's not even within the scope of your studies. Number three, assets for which recoverable amount is fair value less cost to sell in terms of IS-36. So what have we said? IFRS 13 applies to fair value less cost to sell. So you're going to have to determine where the inputs come from. But the lucky thing is that when you are testing for impairment and you find that the recoverable amount is the fair value less cost to sell and you're going to impair your asset now to the recoverable amount being the fair value less cost to sell, you are exempt from the disclosure requirements. Okay, so that's the good news. But you are not exempt from the rest of IFRS 13. You still have to adhere to the levels, the level one, two, and three. You know, the valuation techniques that must be appropriate, the inputs that must be observable, etc., etc. You're still going to aim for the highest possible level. But if you do then calculate fair value less cost to sell and you're impairing your asset to that, then you're not going to disclose all of the information that will follow this slide. Let's move to slide 25. What are the classes of disclosure? What does that mean? Sometimes disclosure is only required for all similar classes of assets together and sometimes it will be for individual assets. Now let's read what the standard says. Disclosures sometimes required for, dis for classes of assets or liabilities only. Classes to be determined based on nature, characteristics and risks of the assets and liabilities, as well as the level of the fair value hierarchy within which the fair value measurement is categorized. Professional judgment is required. Level 3 fair value measurements may require greater number of classes of assets and liabilities. So what are they saying? The more reliable, the more observable, the more independent, the more objective your inputs, the bigger the classes or the more you can aggregate into classes. But the lower you go down with your inputs to level three, the smaller the classes because you need more explanatory information due to the low quality of your inputs. All right. Some disclosures are differentiated on whether the measurements are recurring or non-recurring. All right. So if you think about investment property, that's recurring on an annual basis. All right. And you will see that some of the disclosures relate to assets specifically that are measured at fair value at on a recurring basis. That's a higher risk. Do you agree? Because that happens on an ongoing basis. Whereas a one sort fair value measurement that affects this set of financial statements and not again. All right. So what it, that, that could be something like a non-current asset held for sale. All right. That you transfer and you measure the fair value less cost to sell. All right, so that doesn't happen on a recurring basis. All right, so that's why you will see that that document that I've put on the website for you that you can download, it's that document that summarizes what are the disclosure requirements in 
you know, all the circumstances. But I decided that I'm not going to read it to you on camera when you can read it yourself in that document and it's summarized already uh, and you can just go and study that. All right. Then slide number 26, minimum disclosure. That's what I'm talking about. Certain minimum disclosures are required by IFRS 13 for each class of assets and liabilities measured at fair value in the statement of financial position after initial recognition. So this means whether you are in level 1, level 2 or level 3 in obtaining your inputs, doesn't matter. You're going to have to do the disclosure in respect of these paragraphs. Now they are also on the document that you can download from the website. I'll tell you again how to get there, www.caacademy.co.za and you click on education and then you go to the home page automatically and you scroll right down to the bottom and that's where you will find the slides as well as this document summarizing the disclosure requirements. Okay, slide 27. The effective date of IFRS 13 applies to annual reporting periods beginning or after on or after 1 January 2013. Earlier application is allowed but must be disclosed. Prospective disclosure is required from the first period in which the disclosure is provided. All right, so those are the principles of IFRS 13. Ladies and gentlemen, you can see IFRS 13 is not a very conceptual standard. It's rule-based. And this is what we are getting due to the convergence project. Do you agree? Where the ISB is converging with FASB, you know, the United States Board uh, developing accounting standards. The United States or the, you know, the financial accounting standards of the FASB are a bit more rule-driven. The ISB's financial standards are a bit more principle-based. So now that these two are getting together, you are seeing new standards like this. I think personally, IFRS 13 is rule-driven. There's a lot of disclosure that's required, but it's not difficult to understand. The main challenge of IFRS 13 is to get all of this information together in practice and then to make sure that your financial statements are still looking like something that people want to page through and that it doesn't look like a telephone index, you know, uh, that people just say, oh, you know what, there's so much information, I'm not even opening it up. So we have to weigh up all of those uh, concerns, but in the end, transparency is increased, so the usefulness of the financial statements will definitely be increased. I hope you enjoyed the lecture, and I hope that you're looking at our other lectures on our website, and I hope that you're enjoying them too. Best of luck with your studies.